The Lord be with you. And also with you. It's a joy to have you here in the house of the Lord today. This is a good day. This is the, the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. In fact, today is not only just a good day. Today is a grape day. And it's a grape day because it's a pun because the readings for today are all about two different vineyards. We have vineyard in the Old Testament and vineyard in the New Testament reading, so it's a grape day. Anyways, I shared that with the first service, and the vicar says it's a dad joke. He'll tell you more later. But uh, in the way of announcements this morning, we'll begin with our typical Pastor Dana update. He's doing well. We met with him Thursday. He's, uh, the latest thing for, for the bionic man is he has kind of this black... Um, strap kind of corset thing that he wears it is a um a bone what do they call it? a bone mm, stimulate bone growth stimulator which sends the signal to the spinal material uh, and encourages it to grow which is just remarkable technology and i pray for him as he wears his corset two hours every day and uh, uh as he continues to strengthen and, and join us when the time is right. Continue to pray for him. Um, I'll also pray for our president this morning, as I always do, or we usually do at least, no matter who is president, for the sake of good governance and order civically. But this time we get to add for the health of, which is a great reminder that no matter what your status, you are not uh, uh, immune from anything that everyone else in the world is susceptible to. So that's kind of a, a, a bit of a reminder and a thank you for continuing to patiently abide by the, the procedures and the protocols we have in place and trying to refrain from congregating in the narthex. Some of you did better at that than others this morning. Um, but keep trying to work on that for good reason. We appreciate it. Thank you. Um, there is today at the end of the service, as I mentioned last week, that quick five-minute voters meeting. I think the, uh, the proposal is in your bulletin again this week. Um, so that's there. If you are a new, I'm not sure this applies to anyone this time around, but if you are a new member to Bethlehem and have not voted before, there is an official voters book that you must write your name in. And I put that on the narthex if we have anyone that that applies to. Uh, that is back there. So it'll take five minutes after service. We will do that. Finally, today is the first day of the baby bottle campaign. Uh, there's that insert in your bulletin. Uh, do read it, take it home, and pray for this campaign. Uh, I forget the number, but last year it was astounding to me what those little bottles brought in. It's a, a wonderful ministry. Take your bottle home, fill it with your change, maybe a few bills here and there. Um, and do what you can to support a very important ministry where uh, women can be supported and loved the way that the church loves and supports women. Uh, that's a great ministry. I'm not sure Anna will be back there, so if she's not, pick up your bottle anyways on the way out. Uh, that is it for my announcements. Today is a grape day, and um, Vicar shared with the first service, you can share your insight into that. Joke. Well, what I have learned is that is actually qualifying as a dad joke. And the reason for that is the punchline is apparent. <laughs> and it took me quite a while to get it in first service as well. So if this is a, a great day or a great day. Anytime the Lord comes to us in his word, in his holy meal, the fruit of the vine. It is a good day. Let's stand together and receive our Lord's gifts. Singing.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. As we come to our time of confession and absolution, you're invited to kneel as you're able. O oh God, our Father, since you have set forth the way of life for us in your beloved Son, we confess with shame our slowness to learn from him, our failure to follow his guidance, and our reluctance to bear the cross. We acknowledge that we are by nature sinful and unclean and know in our hearts that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. Have mercy on us and forgive us, O Lord. Forgive us for all that is amiss in our lives as we continually break your commands. Forgive us that we have not always been fruitful plantings in your vineyard. Have mercy on us and forgive us, O Lord. Upon this your confession and by the command of our Lord, I, a called and ordained servant of Christ, forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. May the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Amen. Having heard those words of forgiveness from our Lord, we stand together to sing. be with you. Let us pray. Gracious God, you gave your son into the hands of sinful men who killed him. Forgive us when we reject your unfailing love and grant us the fullness of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ, your son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. At this time, the congregation may be seated. We hear now the readings appointed for this, the uh, 18th Sunday after Pentecost. And uh, we uh, hear in the Old Testament, the prophet of Isaiah, the fifth chapter, the first vineyard of our two vineyards today. This vineyard is one that the Lord is judging. Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. 
my beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. And he looked for it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I looked for it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? Now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned or hoed, and briars and thorns shall grow up. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant planting. And he looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed. For righteousness, but behold, an outcry. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our epistle reading comes to us today as we continue reading through this book from the letter to the Philippians. The third chapter where Paul witnesses to the congregation there at Philippi. Paul writes, If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite the congregation at this time to stand as you are able. This morning we hear the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 21st chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, Hear another parable. There was a master of a house who planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a wine press in it and built a tower and leased it to tenants and went out into another country. When the season for fruit drew near, he took his servants to the tenants to get his fruit. And the tenants took his servants and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants, more than the first. And they did the same to them. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, 
they will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and have his inheritance. And they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. When, therefore, the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and let out the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the fruits in their seasons. Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruits. And the one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. And when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard this parable, they perceived that he was speaking about them. And although they were seeking to arrest him, they feared the crowds, because they held him to be a prophet. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. At this time, we join together confessing our faith as a unified, a unified witness to the world, but also as a consistent witness one to another here in this place, reminding each other of the faith we confess. In the words of the Apostles' Creed, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Congregation may be seated. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you remain the same throughout all generations. You are just in your judgments, awesome in your power and magnificence, full of wisdom, slow to anger and abounding in love. We ask that you once again show your goodness towards us as you always show your faithfulness to those who trust in you because you are both merciful and and compassionate. Grant that your Holy Spirit be in our hearts today, and let the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Amen. The text for today's message comes to us from our gospel reading, and I'll read a portion of the text again. 
Jesus said, listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and went away on a journey. When the harvest time approached, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect his fruit. The tenants seized the servants. They beat one, killed another, and stoned a third. Then he sent other servants to them, more than the first time, and the tenants treated them the same way. Last of all, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, This is the heir. Come, let's kill him and take the inheritance. So they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? The Pharisees and chief priests replied, He will bring those wretches to a wretched end and will rent the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his share of the crop at harvest time. This is our text. How long until your patience is worn thin? I was quiet there for just about 10 seconds, but I could tell some of you were eager for me to start talking. What's he going to say? I think to some degree or another, we all struggle with patience. Take, for example, the Hot Pocket. You know that on-the-go snack? You stick it in the microwave for a few minutes, and then you got a treat for yourself on the go. Well, how often have you or I bit into a Hot Pocket and not had the patience to let it cool down first. I can tell you for myself, I've burnt my tongue quite a few times on those little guys. To one degree or another, patience is a struggle at some point in our lives. I know for me there are some points when it seems like it's very easy to be patient and I can put up with quite a lot. And yet there are other parts of my life where my patience seems almost non-existent. And I wonder where my temper is gone and why I rush to judgment. God tells us that patience is a virtue, that it's a fruit of the Spirit, but how does that look in our lives? I think patience is hardest for us most of all when we see something that just isn't right. It's unfair, it's an injustice, and we want justice to be swift. I know between siblings, sometimes they'll borrow each other's toys or clothes. How quickly do they want those toys or clothes back? Even if they have no intention on using them in the next few hours? Or take a more serious example. A a high-level manager of some company is caught embezzling funds. How soon is the company going to act once they have that knowledge? We want justice to be swift. And stealing is a particular affront to us. God has given us dignity in our possessions by commanding us not to steal from one another. And when someone has stolen from us, usually our patience isn't quite as long as maybe we would like. But in our parable for today, we discover that God's patience is greater than we can imagine. Jesus starts off in a very familiar way to his listeners. They would have heard that Old Testament Isaiah parable. And they would have been very familiar with God planting his vineyard and asking them to judge between his vineyard and them. But Jesus here adds his own twist to the parable. He adds the tenants. The tenants who have forgotten who the vineyard really belongs to. In the Old Testament reading, it was the grapes that caused all the trouble. But here in our text, it's the tenants that stir things up. You would think, after the first batch of servants was sent, the master might try a different strategy, wouldn't you? Seriously, one is beaten, one is stoned, and another is killed? 
You'd think he'd send soldiers the second time. But he gives them a very strange opportunity to repent. His patience is greater than we can imagine. And so he sends a second batch of servants, but they are treated the exact same way. And finally, the master gives them one more chance. He sends his son, someone who has his authority on him. But they do not relent. The tenants believe that they can possess the vineyard for themselves. They don't believe that the master will come for the vineyard and that since they killed the son, the vineyard is now theirs. But after they reject the son, the master's patience finally runs out. And according to the Pharisees, what God will do to those tenants is he will bring those wretches to a wretched end. And in saying that, they trap themselves. You see, often in Jesus' day, the problem was that people did not understand the parables he was telling. But in this instance, the chief priests and Pharisees knew exactly what Jesus was accusing them of. He was saying, you are these wicked tenants that have rejected what God has told you. You are not giving him his due with the vineyard. Instead of helping the destitute and the poor, instead of helping the sinner, they chose to exclude them from the vineyard. But God will come for his vineyard. He sends servants to them, prophets who preach to them, and finally he has sent to them his own son, and they have a choice to make. Will they accept the authority of the son, or will they reject it? Jesus' parable here becomes prophetic because the Pharisees do choose to put Jesus to death and in doing so they've trapped themselves as God will take away their lease of the land and he will give the vineyard to others no longer will they have authority over God's people because even though our God has shown great patience to them God will come for his vineyard, and no one will stand between him and it. The way that God chooses to do this is by vindicating his son, raising him to life. As we heard from Jesus, the stone the builders has rejected has become the capstone. And the son the tenants rejected has been raised to life and crowned king. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Jesus, and it is Jesus' desire to give the vineyard to those who will produce fruit for him. And the promise Jesus gives us is this, that you can partake in the blessings of the vineyard. All who repent and believe in him will get to partake of that great blessing. The great blessings of the vineyard are yours in Christ Jesus. And so we are the new tenants of the vineyard of God. And God has chosen us as stewards of this vineyard to tend it and take care of it. Part of our mission here on earth is learning how to live properly as his stewards. And that means learning patience, like our heavenly father is patient. Because like I said, we wouldn't send a second batch of servants, let alone a son or a daughter to the vineyard. We would have sent in soldiers. But here's the thing. You and I, we don't get to decide when God's patience runs out. It can be frustrating to watch some kind of injustice play out before our eyes. We want justice. We want God to act. And we don't understand why God sometimes seems like he's not acting. But there's a patience that God has. And in that patience, there is a wisdom. That wisdom that we can't necessarily see right away. Because patience produces fruit. Take, for example, the Apostle Paul. Before he was an apostle, he was a persecutor of the church. He stood by approvingly as they stoned one of God's servants to death. Stephen was witnessing to him, giving him the message of Jesus, but he chose to reject it. And he persecuted the church at large, forcing Christians to blaspheme. And 
persecuting them all the more. In fact, in his first encounter with Jesus, he was on his way to another city, Damascus, where he was intending to persecute the Christians there. But instead of raining down judgment, Jesus reveals to Paul his reign and rule. And unlike the tenants in our parable, Paul repents. Paul sees the authority of Jesus and he submits to him. And because of God's patience towards him, much fruit was produced. He became God's missionary to the Gentiles, preaching the gospel all over the Roman Empire. What's more, he authored nearly a third of the New Testament. That's why we have a reading from him almost every Sunday. God's patience in Paul produced fruit. Or we could take another one of God's missionaries as an example. William Carey, if you're willing to travel back in time with me a couple of hundred years, was a missionary to the people of India. And he displayed great patience towards them and eventually became known as the father of modern missions. But his road wasn't an easy one. As a matter of fact, in addition to all the other struggles he faced... It was seven years before he saw his first convert to Jesus. Now, i got to wonder in those first few years, was he ever up late at night? Wondering, God, what are you doing with me here in India? It just seems like nothing's happening. Or maybe a friend wrote to him and told him, just give up, Will. It's not worth it. Come home. Did Carrie ever despair? It couldn't have been easy for him, and it would be very easy for fear to creep into his life. To say, oh, just because God hasn't done anything in these first few years, that means that God will never do anything through you here. But Kerry had patience. He established schools for the poor and destitute. He learned their language so that he could communicate with them and even translate the Bible for them. His work laid the foundation for generations of missionaries to come. And by the end of his 41 years in India, he saw more than 700 people turn to Christ. The patience that God had worked in William Carey, he was able to use that to produce fruit in India. Fast forwarding just a little bit. I'd like to tell you a story my friend Vito told me. In his teenage years, he had wandered from God, and he said he felt like the prodigal son in a lot of ways, spending his time in wild living. But there was someone, a tenant, a steward of God's vineyard that never gave up on him. She was always reminding him both of her love for him and God's love for him, and she prayed for him every day. So much so that Vito tells me that he says if it wasn't for her, he's not sure he would have returned to Jesus. He told me the world is changed by godly grandmas. To a lot of people, I'm sure the grandmother's actions would have looked just a little bit futile. Nothing's happening, but she refused to give up. She had a patience that was worked in her by God. There's an old saying that says someone today is lying in the shade of a tree because someone else planted a sapling years ago. And this grandmother spent her time planting seeds of God's word so that that her son could share one day in the blessings of the vineyard. And as you reflect on your own life, I'm sure that you can see that God's patience has been at work for you as well. After all, none of us are perfect, far from it. We have strayed from God, but God recruited us. He took the initiative in recruiting us to be the new tenants of his vineyard kingdom. And because of his gracious hand, we get to enjoy the blessings of the vineyard, his forgiveness. We can't forget, though, this vineyard does not belong to us. It is God's, and God will come for his vineyard.
This means in our dealings with other people, we must learn patience. Because our Heavenly Father has been patient with us, working with us through all our sins. It's so common in this world today to come to snap judgments and decisions, to be quick to condemn and divide the lines. But what if the church was different from that? What if the church was known as the place where we showed the incredible patience of God? What if we showed the same love that Jesus showed to sinners, always bringing them into his loving care? I'm asking you to consider today, who is God calling you to be patient with? Pray for them. Be there for them. Show them the heart of your heavenly Father who is patient with you and will be patient with them. Show them the grace that Jesus Christ has won for them. Be patient with them. It might seem at times like your efforts are being wasted, but God often works behind the scenes in ways that are not immediately evident to us. And patience produces fruit. And when our time on this earth is done, God will come to reap the harvest, and we will share in the rich blessings of the vineyard together in the new creation, loved by God. God will come for his vineyard, brothers and sisters. and He will come for you as well to be restored. All this we say and confess in the name of Jesus, And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit abide with you now and forevermore. Amen. Invite the congregation to stand now as you are able. As we come to our time of prayer this morning, our prayer response will be, hear our prayer. Let us pray. Merciful Lord, you have planted us as your own vineyard, that we might bear good fruit for your glory. Grant to us grace that we may indeed be faithful and show forth in our lives the the good works that glorify you and serve your purposes. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy Lord, rescue us from all enemies of your church and bless us with church leaders whose voices will not waver in the face of threat. Bless Matthew president of the Synod, Greg, our district president, Dana, our circuit visitor and senior pastor here at Bethlehem, and Andrew, our vicar. Inspire men and women to go into church work vocations and bless those preparing for such work. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Mighty Lord, give to the nation's the desire for peace. Thwart the actions of terrorists and those who would oppress with the power of fear. Bless Donald, our president, not only in providing wisdom to govern prudently according to your will, but also in regard to his health. Bless too Ron, our governor. And bless all who pass or or enforce or judge our laws. Spare us from disease and fear. Deliver the poor from want and help us to provide jobs and worthy employment for all. 
Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Everlasting Father, guide husbands and wives to love and forgive each other and strengthen them in their life together. Bless the homes in which your people dwell. Help parents to be faithful examples for their children and give room in their hearts and homes so that orphans may know the, the joy of a place and a home to call their own. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Finally, O oh God of love, deliver the sick from their illnesses. Give relief to the suffering. Help the troubled to know peace of mind. And be with the grieving and those in their final days. Guide all healthcare professionals to serve those in need. And give patience to those who must bear with their infirmities and disabilities and infertility. Hear us especially today for those in need who are dear to us. For Sue Aishan, Jeannie and Roger Roman, Norman Joan Matt Mueller, Pastor Dana, the Rockhold family, and all those dealing with the effects of the COVID-19 virus. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask all these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This is my blood of the New Testament which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Please stand. Now may this, the true body and blood of your Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen and keep you in both body and soul, now and on to life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, our Heavenly Father, you have again welcomed us at your table and have given us a foretaste of the feast to come in your glorious kingdom. Strengthen us through this blessed gift that we live with assurance and confidence, free from every fear. Grant that your Holy Spirit enlighten us with his gifts, that we be people who rejoice in your promises and live to your glory. Sanctify and keep us in the one true faith throughout this earthly life until we come at last to the company of saints and angels in light eternal. We ask this in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Receive now the benediction of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. And the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Go in peace as you love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, if you have five minutes, your first act of serving the Lord and your fellow congregant, 